welcome to the first lecture of our Understanding the Unite series. Today I want to talk about the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, a country where I spent four years of my life, uh, fell in love even, uh, worked for various NGOs, and I want to talk about nationalism in Jordan, king and tribe or patriotism. So today's lecture is really going to be focused on what is Arab nationalism within Jordan, how is it constructed, and we're going to look at how Jordan as a country has created nationalism as a form of resistance to an external other, especially. And then we're also going to look at tribalism, which is at the core, I think, of the Jordanian uh, national identity in a sense. So for today, this will be the, if you like, the lead topic. And we will talk about the Hashemites and Ottoman resistance. Uh, we will then discuss Transjordan and regime security, so how tribes became bonded to the monarchy as well. Uh, Transjordan is a term that came into effect before we had the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, which I believe was officially done in the 40s. So Transjordan, the idea that Jordan was part of something bigger, a bigger project, which we'll discuss. We also will discuss the East-West Bank divide under King Hussein and the Jordan first or al urdan Awalan campaign under the current King Abdullah II that was seen as a way of trying to unite all Jordanians. All right, so let's get started. Let's do this. I just want to quickly mention for today's background behind me, we have the Umayyad Palace, which is part of Oman's ruins, the capital of Jordan. A uh, very beautiful part of the city. You get an amazing view of Jordan's capital. It is one of the few places I've been to in the world where um, modernity and Roman ruins, Arab ruins and other ruins coexist so wonderfully. You know, you can go down to, to downtown and get yourself a cup of coffee or falafel and then right next to stores there's uh, ruins from the Roman era. So definitely worth going back to once the lockdown is over. But anyway, let's start with Ottoman resistance. The Ottomans had a massive empire that came to an end effectively in 1918. This is when we have the start of the first, uh, or the end, I'm sorry, of the First World War. And at that time, of course, there were a lot of Arab subjects who began to go through what they may have discovered to be, or may have said, is a rediscovery of their culture. So at this time, there were many Arabs who felt persecuted, that they were forced to live a life that they did not necessarily want to live under Ottoman rule. And as the cracks in that empire began to show, we had the Great Arab Revolt led by Sharif Hussein. This revolt united various Arabs under his leadership and was in a sense the start of Hashemite uh, legitimacy. The start of the Arab revolution saw before the creation of Jordan as an official kingdom. We now see the Hashemites taking lead in a revolution that, that I think had a lot of support within Arabia itself and at a time when of course we didn't necessarily have the states that we have now. So what happened was a lot of Arabs began to respect Sharif Hussein and were willing to follow Hashemite rule across what we would call Pan-Arabia and we saw the creation of more than one kingdom in the long run. Some of these kingdoms sadly had to be shelved but we saw firstly the kingdom of the Hejaz in what is now Saudi Arabia. We also saw the Hashemite monarchy of Iraq that would eventually be gunned down in a violent coup by Ba'athists. Uh, that is something perhaps we can deal with in another lecture and also the creation of Transjordan itself what we now call the Hashemite kingdom Jordan. So Transjordan, in a sense, was a compromised state. It was a British protectorate, and it wasn't until 1923 that it was recognized as an emirate under Emir Abdullah I, who we see pictured here to the left with John Glubb, who was known as Pasha Glubb. This was a British military advisor who was quite close to the Emir at the time, and it became problematic because British assistance and uh, what some perceived as interference would affect the monarchy's image especially in the 50s when we saw the rise of Republican nationalism that argued that monarchies were basically puppets of the British and puppets of um, colonial powers. At this time, British administrative assistance was set up in Jerusalem or Al-Quds, what is now what you would call Palestine. And Jordan itself didn't even have its own stamps. It had stamps imported from Palestine with the values handwritten. So it really feels like the kingdom was quickly created. It was really an emirate. And also Transjordan, why Transjordan? The idea that Jordan was in the middle of something else, a greater Arabian project, the desire to have a greater kingdom by the Hashemites 
And as I said, that ambition had to be shelved eventually. This is a photo of yours truly uh, when I was living in Jordan with uh, a Bedouin guard, I believe, by Mudarij Romani. This is the uh, Roman theater, the ruins of the Roman theater. So here, under Transjordan, nationalism wasn't necessarily about loyalty to the state, but more loyalty to monarchy. And this is very interesting because we see this concept of re regime security across the Arab world. Here we had disparate tribes who were willing to work together to protect the regime or protect the monarchy in exchange for privileges, cash, public sector employment that continues to this day, but also religion. And that's something which I might deal with in more detail in other lectures. Tribes are often quite localized. And I, as I said, I've lived in Jordan. I've visited different towns. You go from the capital, Amman, to Salt, which is 25 minutes by, by bus. And the dialect they speak there is slightly different than it is in Amman. So centralized authority was not something that was part of the tribal culture of what we now call Jordan, but it was in a sense imposed by Hashemite rule in a transactional relationship. Regime security from the tribes in exchange for recognition of tribal power, authority, privileges, but also religion. The Hashemites descend from the Prophet Muhammad and that itself became if you like a, a almost a selling point of religious legitimacy that you're following someone who's descended from the first muslim if you like the messenger of allah if you like and so religion also acted as a unitary force tribal honor which is very central to various tribal cultures then became linked to monarchy and to socio-economic privileges in fact uh, abdullah the second the current king in a 2013 interview he described this relationship somewhat and i believe it was um the impression of this relationship was that it was highly transactional. But before we go to Abdullah II, let's talk about his father, King Hussein. Uh, King Hussein came into the picture in 1952, he was very young, and he started his rule at a time when there was already a lot of uh, regional uh, quarrels within the Arab world, certainly under Gamal Abdel Nasser, who was the first president of the Egyptian Republic, he overthrew the monarchy. And this is important because King Hussein then found that he had to contend with one of the largest Arab countries in the world. Egypt is the most populous nation and it's also seen as a place of culture and learning. Uh, when Saddam Hussein of Iraq uh, was uh, shot at and had to leave Iraq and go into hiding for a while after an attempted coup attempt, he went to Egypt. Many people went to Egypt and Muammar Gaddafi of Libya, who overthrew the Libyan monarchy, he listened fervently to Egypt's radio station and saw Nasser as an inspiration. So we're getting a picture here of a time when nationalism in the Arab world was really about republicanism, not monarchy. And a lot of Republicans would not hesitate to say that monarchies were puppets of the British or puppets of Americans and they should go. So we have here a situation in which King Hussein had to deal very carefully with Egypt and with Nasser himself. And at this time, especially after the 1967 loss of the West Bank that used to be Jordanian territory, we see that tribalism became even more entrenched as a form of regime security uh, to the point where tribal laws or tribal customs are highly recognized in Jordan. And the courts, although they may not officially um, work along tribal lines, they may not be willing to legally resolve certain disputes between tribes or families unless those tribes have already settled things informally through their own tribal customs. So very interesting. This is here when we get the East-West Bank split. So suddenly we have East Bankers who are basically the Bedouin or the Jordanian tribes who have all these benefits and who, by the way, are now in the minority uh, within the Kingdom of Jordan versus what we call West Bankers. So Palestinians who, especially after 1967, came from the West Bank into Jordan and they were seen as refugees, they were granted citizenship, and they dominate the business sector especially. So the East Bank uh, group, if you like, they often gain public sector employment as part of this relationship with the monarchy. Public sector employment is one of the reasons that they are loyal, uh, and East Bank privileges can include free education, uh, land, assets, so title deeds, and also what we call wasta. So if you know the right person, you'll get the job. If you are the, 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 the cousin of the right person, you'll get the job because this is how you keep things within tribal lines. The West Bankers do not have such privileges, so they rely a lot more on meritocracy. 
they run some of the largest businesses in the kingdom. Here I have a photo of Sakishha, which is a very famous jeweler across Jordan. They have a lot of stores, not just in the capital, but beyond. They're one of the biggest businesses in Jordan, and they are Palestinian. So here we have this interesting look at the fact that Palestinians are really running the business sector and are part of the business elite, whereas the East Bankers often are the ones who have propped up the monarchy and who are part of the public sector. One of my colleagues in Jordan, uh, I believe it was two years ago, he visited some of the largest tribes in Jordan, and he said that support for the monarchy is waning. Why? Because the well is running dry. And what you would find is that a, a generation ago, those from the East Bank would unquestioningly support the monarchy. Whereas now, the youth of these tribes who are under 30, they're turning around saying, you know what, we don't have jobs. We don't have the same kind of privileges or cash. Why should we support the monarchy? And this is going to be a problem over the next few years, especially when the crown prince, who is half Palestinian, comes to power. Israel, of course, is another neighbor that Jordan has had to contend with. Uh, Jordan is one of few states that has signed a treaty with Israel. And from 1967 onwards, we saw a shift. Uh, from my research, from my, my time in Jordan, nationalism, Arab nationalism, often focuses on the threat of an external other. We see this with Egypt as well, the idea of imperialism being a threat, the idea of monarchy being a threat. Um, so first we had Ottoman rule, as a threat. And so the resistance to Ottomans that led to, of course, the first Jordanian state uh, and to the Pan-Arabian project that uh, Amir Abdul I wanted. Then from 1967, we see this idea of Israel as a hostile other. And we also see that this increased because when the West Bank was lost, one of the things that was physically lost for King Hussein was the physical custodianship of holy shrines in Jerusalem especially Al-Aqsa Mosque. And so although the current uh, King Abdullah II, as far as I'm aware, he continues to claim, of course, lineage to the Prophet Muhammad, but also to claim custodianship of Al-Aqsa Mosque, can he physically visit the mosque? This is an issue. So at a time when this religious legitimacy was challenged because the West Bank was then taken by Israel, we see that the Jordanian armed forces were promoted through very aggressive language as defenders of holy shrines in Jerusalem. Um, the notion at the same time internally in Jordan that you had East and West Bank divisions became an issue. Uh, we saw that I believe an assassination attempt on King Hussein led to the purging of Palestinians from the public sector at some point. This is called Black September. But at the same time, later on, King Hussein wanted to ensure that there was a return to Pan-Arabism slightly more to counter potential divisions. And uh, there were attempts to, to unite at least rhetorically, Palestinians or West Bankers and East Bank Jordanians so that they would not necessarily see each other as as uh, separate or different, that you know they were all Jordanian. The 1994 peace treaty with Israel is seen by many as having been done for survival because Jordan is a country that has no resources. It relies on aid, especially from the United States. And so the idea was that Israel, as one of the largest allies of the U.S. within the Middle East, was likely to be able to lobby for aid on Jordan's behalf. Now, talking about the idea of Jordanian identity is very interesting because we've discussed here that there's been an entrenched tribalism as part of the Jordanian identity, that nationalism really is about monarchy first and this transactional relationship between the tribes and the monarchy that they are supposed to support. So um, in the 2000s, at some point, we had a campaign called Jordan First, launched by Abdullah II, the current king. The idea was to replace the tribalism of privilege with equality, rule of law, accountability, human rights, democracy, and so on and so forth. And at this point, we see Abdullah II taking a step back and saying, I am the king of Jordan. I am not the king of all Arabs. Why is that important? Because he's basically saying that his predecessors, especially his now, I believe, his grandfather, uh, who had this Pan-Arabian project that that is no longer the case for Jordan or for the Hashemites, that they rule one kingdom and one kingdom only, and that's it. So the, the language around nationalism has changed within Jordan. At the same time, critics have said that Jordan first was basically a publicity stunt. Uh, it does not get rid of deep-rooted cultural structures. And I would say that Jordan represents a centralized monarchy. It is not as highly centralized as, for example, Oman, but there are structural issues. Trialism is still part of the nation's identity. 
uh, and privileges. When I lived in Jordan, I remember that I attended working for an NGO. Uh, we attended the 2013 parliamentary elections. They had a 53% turnout. And a lot of critics said that votes were cast along tribal lines, not along the lines that were all Jordanian. So what are some of the motives that could push King Abdullah II into not only Jordan first, but taking that initiative seriously and saying we need to unite as Jordanians? Uh, firstly, the crown prince pictured here with his father is half Palestinian. And Queen Rani herself is of Palestinian descent. I believe she was born in Kuwait. So we see here a tug of war that may become more serious. Uh, when the Arab Spring began, one of the issues was that the tribes, they, they actually released a statement uh, criticizing Queen Rania, saying that she is going beyond what has been agreed between the monarchy and um, the tribes, so that she's building her own power centers for herself and that she's not supposed to do that. In other words, she's seen as a threat. So we see here that tribalism continues to be entrenched as, as a, a form of rule, really, within Jordan. But now, I'd say over the past three, four years, it may be challenged because Jordan is facing various economic uh, slowdowns and, of course, the coronavirus. That is something I wish to discuss in more detail with another lecture, but how the coronavirus could be used by the current king to actually cement his legitimacy by saying, you know, I am able to, to, to keep the lockdown. It's strict. I've deployed the military, but it means that I keep people safe. And that means that I am the right person for this job. I am still king of this country. I still have the right to rule. What we will see is when the king passes and his son has to take over as a half Palestinian crown prince, how powerful will the tribes be? How loyal or not will they be? There have been uh, rumors and talk of King Abdullah trying to launch various initiatives to start entrepreneur entrepreneurship programs uh, involving Palestinians in the kingdom, in part to shift his power base from the tribes to Palestinian youth. And that may be possibly because of his son who will soon or at some point will take over. And I personally believe that although Jordan has had a brush with the Arab Spring and people keep talking about whether or not Jordan will survive, really the country's test will be when the crown prince becomes king and has to deal with the tribes and deal with whatever the current king has on his plate. Now, before I round off with the conclusion, I want to play a video very quickly in which the current king's mother was interviewed. This is back in the 70s and towards the end of the interview which is by Thames TV I believe she is asked would you want your eldest son to be king and she replies no I do not want my son to be king I would hate to think of anyone taking that job because I see what my husband goes through every day I know the pressures surrounding it um, if the boy is strong willed referring to her eldest son and if King Hussein wishes it then yes he may take over, which is what ended up happening. But it's very interesting what she has to say that this is a job that no one should take, that it is a job no one wants. And King Abdullah himself even said that he felt some of his cousins and others, the further away they are from the throne, the more they think it would be good to be king. But the reality is that is not the case. So to conclude, when it comes to Jordan's nationalism, we have seen historically the resistance of an external other, starting with the Ottomans, also to an extent Israel, uh, especially from 67 up to the peace treaty. And we've also seen, of course, internal divisions that have led to the creation of the Jordan First Campaign, a form of nationalism intended to unite all Jordanians. To what extent that campaign is real and to what extent it can override the tribalism so inherent within Jordan, that remains to be seen. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Dr. Nikolai Dugunderson. Thank you.